Oh, but no. Jimmy McNulty, welcome to Stockport County Live. Good afternoon, sir. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, all good, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Um, been a long time trying to get to this point and arrange a date, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> glad to be here, mate. Good to be on. No, good. We're, we should say there is slight banging um, in the background, but we'll fix all that. Let's not worry too much about it. It's not people's computers or earphones going funny. <laughs> Um, we saw you a couple of weeks ago um, for Rochdale at County, pre-season friendly. How was it coming back? It was great, mate. Uh, I've been back a number of times over the years. It's been a long time since I left now, but uh, really good. Always feels slightly like home coming back to County. Um, some of my best days were, were at County. And just the just feel of the club. Always such a big club. So well supported. Such a sleeping giant. Um, it, just, it just it feels like being back at County all oh, good. We we had a bit of a chat after the game um, the other week, and you were saying that you've seen this show. You've seen people like Gary Dicker, Liam Dickinson, Tommy Rowe, all your former teammates coming on here. Do you, do you stay in touch with any of those guys? Are you, have you been able to just kind of catch up where possible? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of like friendship groups, that that that. Being at that club sort of forged my friendship group for the next 10 years. I'm still um, in regular contact with Gary Dickett, as you mentioned. And, um, James Tunnicliffe actually is you know, one of my best friends in life. Um, our wives are very good friends. We, we actually lived next door to each other in an apartment in Stockport when I first moved there. And um, yeah, that the friendship between our, our girlfriends at the time blossomed. And they're still thick as thieves. So me and James are still very much in each other's lives, and so are our children now. But yeah, Gary Dicker, Leon McSweeney, and the legend that is Liam Dickinson, larger than life character, is still in and out of my life. Michael Rains, good friend, I know he's back at the club now, and um, a coaching capacity, which I think is great, by the way. And what a great person to have back around the club. Um, he was a, he was an incredible representative of the club. Yeah. Yeah, a great did, lad as well. Did it bring back memories hearing those guys? I mean, I remember Gary Dicker in particular talking about the Wembley days and looking up and feeling a bit spooked when he saw the Wembley arch and everything. Did, did it bring it all back? Yeah, it did, yeah. Um, an amazing day. Still probably the best day um, I've had in football. Um, I've had multiple promotions and stuff now over the years, but that was the first and it, it was done at Wembley. It was so special and the only shame about it all was because we were so young, myself included, I didn't actually realise how special it was, how good the group was, how good those players were. And I've since gone on to learn, being elsewhere, how hard it is to actually consistently win matches. And yeah. I think I was there for a calendar year, January to January, before I moved on to Brighton. And wins just seem to come easily in games. Gannon would set up a plan, Jim would set up a plan and the player would carry it out, we'd get another win. It was amazing times and just uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a special group of players. It's interesting that you say that. I speak about the players and the journey in just a moment, but on the on the side of the mentality, you're not the first player from that group of players or from previous groups, you know, when we've had players on from the 90s and, and whatnot, who say that same sentence. They're saying they're not being big-headed, they weren't being over-exuberant or whatever. They just knew they were going to win. You know, they, it wasn't about puffing your chest out or whatever. You just had that belief, the mentality that every game you're going to win. Yeah, yeah. And it came from, obviously, the evidence of, of, winning, of winning games all the time. So there was no reason to not think we wouldn't win the next game. Jim was was so studious in terms of setting up plans and in, in, in terms of how the opposition worked. He do so much work. Um, again, that was another thing that I was naive to think that every manager in football would be like that. I've, I've gone on to find that, that they're certainly not. Jim's an incredible coach. Uh, attention to detail is frightening. Um, the work he would do to, to make the game easy for us on a Saturday. Um, you know, it, it deserved it deserved the reward that he got at the time. But yeah, uh, we just always thought we'd win. Uh, youth might have come into that. 
maybe a lack of fear at that particular point. But every player in every position, I always thought he's better than the player he's playing against. He's better than the player he's playing against. And, you know, more often than not, as long as we were okay on the day in terms of a reasonable re performance together, we, we generally got the win more times than we didn't. Do you, do you have any memories of being in the in the dressing room uh, around that time? Because, like you say, you, you've got you've got two kind of trains of thought there. You've got a, you know, there's there's no, you know, he's better than the player he's up against. Like you just said, he's he's be that striker is better than that defender or whatever. But then at the same time, because you're all young lads, you've all got this kind of mate friendship atmosphere going on. So yeah. you've, you've got two reasons to really connect with these guys. Do you, do you have any like recollections of I don't know yeah. half time or full time after a win or who was the who was the class clown or anything like that? I have loads of recollections of party atmospheres in the changing room after games. I have loads of recollections of Liam Dickinson doing stuff that can't be repeated in changing rooms in, in next, to, <laughs> next to no clothing most of the time. <laughs> and then generally he went and done the same thing that night in any any nightclub in Manchester, which you know we ended up invading more or less three nights a week because it just felt like good times. We win, we go out, we come back, we train, we do it again, we win, we go out. And I mean, we're probably out twice twice a week as a group, but socialising. It wasn't always a night out, it generally was after a win, but uh, we were out in the week together as well sometimes. But Liam was out five nights a week, obviously. Uh, on the <laughs> uh, but yeah, loads of memories, mate. Just uh, songs and stuff that come into my head. Um, just, just yeah, good times. Winning football just produces good times for fans and players alike, and uh, just cherish moments in the changing room. When you when you've got that relationship with the players, and you, you mentioned the fans there as well, I think I think fans tend to feed off that energy. You know, and you can say this about County or any other club. When you've when you've got a group of players that are so clearly, I mean, a winning games, right? That's always going to be the most important. But B, yeah. when you can just tell, like County the other year when when we won promotion, you can always tell when they're really mates. Do you know what I mean? When they're really like when people yeah. are getting on, and there's obvious that crack is there, and the fans feed off that, and it amplifies everybody's mood. It does, it does, yeah. They, they go hand in hand. I don't know which one starts the other. Wins are so, so key, obviously. But then to get wins, you need good players. Generally, to get good players, you need a good manager. And the book stops with the manager. Um, Jim and his team, Wardy and Alan Lord, were able to select highly talented young players from around the lower leagues and, and um, within the club already in the youth structure that would fit in, in terms of playing a style of football that at that time, not many teams were doing. It was, yeah. I feel, were a lot tougher than them, uh, tougher back then in terms of physicality. Um, no matter what the first tackle was, as long as it was the first tackle, you know, there was no booking really because, you know, you could lift some off the ground, put them in the stand and just say to ref, ref, it's my first one. And he'd say, yeah, <laughs> no more of that. So the first one was a free one. Generally, we had really talented kids who senior pro from other teams would literally try and put into the stand as early as possible to put them off the game. But um, Jim, again, the coaching team, the lads as good players were able to outmaneuver all that with good football. It was exciting to watch. You know, we had talented, really talented players in the attacking areas that would get bummed off deep as soon as they got the ball. Um, the atmosphere all was sort of fed off each other. The fans were amazing at that, at that time. They were enjoying watching us. We were enjoying training every day. Yeah, Jim, the coaching staff. They we were brave. We were brave. I have to highlight they, they were really brave playing young, young and experienced players over and over again against season pros. And it, it wasn't done too much at the time. I and mean, he was able to do it all in a way that. It was also professional. It wasn't all laughing a joke. It was serious when it came to game time. And we all really wanted to win. It was probably because we all knew what was coming after a win. A good night out. I should, I should, I'm going to tell you something that, that Jim Gannon said the other day now because I don't think he's going to be watching this, so I can get away with saying it. Because he was, he was, we were catching up after the last friendly, and he yeah. was saying he doesn't, he doesn't watch too many of these because 
if people start saying how how good he, he was at his job, it makes him feel a bit, I don't know, not embarrassed, but do you know what I mean? He, a bit blushing maybe. Um, yeah. Yet every single player that we have in here that's either played with him or under him say roughly the same things. When you see he's gone on to have the career he's had, tactically, there just isn't anybody better than him. Would you would, no. would, would you go along with that? Totally, totally. I've had some come close. Um, Gus Poyet was very, very good tactically at Brighton. Uh, really good similar in the sense that the way he had good players, don't get me wrong, he had very good players and he, he probably had a lot larger budget than we did at Stockport. Uh, but he was excellent at devising plans to win games, making it feel like you just breezed through a match and got another win. But Jim, Jim seriously was another level. You know, we come in on Monday mornings and for whatever particular reason, the, the, the best way to beat the next team we were playing against might be a short corner routine. It might be that one particular thing. And he knew if we carried it out correctly, it'd be the certain short corner routine. And he'd go and find a particular example from you know the Japanese A League or, or something. I, I don't know where he where he used to you know pick these gems from, but it was there Monday morning for us all to watch. Tuesday would be another example from the Italian second division. His, his, his library of knowledge on football was incredible when it when it came to tactics. And, uh, as I say, I didn't realise at the time because I hadn't had many managers, but I realise now um, the depth that he went into was incredible. He deserved he deserved to be you know a successful manager. When when you come up against him the other week, and I know it's only a friendly, you can't really read too much, but. <laughs> Jim's in a Jim and County are in a position where they're assembling this whole new squad from an already successful squad. It's not like you know he's, he's starting from scratch. You know we, we won the league, then we're punching really highly in the division above with very little change to the initial team. He's now kind of bring, bringing in the next level of players, if you like. You're up against it, so you weren't playing for it, but you could see it firsthand because you were on the pitch against it. Can you see those trademarks? Those those little kind of Jim Gannonisms, if you like, that, that he's bringing through into the next crop of county players that we're seeing through. Do you see them coming through in the squad that he's building there? Do you mean the current squad he's building now? Yeah, that, that you played against for Rochdale yeah. the other week. Um, I do, yeah. And I, I keep my eye on county. Um, I can't help it because I don't live too far away. Um, and just because it was such a fun time, uh, I would look back. But yeah, seeing them firsthand just a couple of weeks ago, um, was intriguing just to see the style of football he was implementing, the type of players he was putting within those positions. And I see it, I see it. Um, it's certainly not an identical model to what we had, uh, but I do see similarities. I see trends in gym that you know, we like certain players in certain positions and the style of player in certain position. Um, I think he's clever enough to know which league he's playing in. You know, determine which style of football or how much football uh, you can play because whether you like it or not, conditions do dictate how well a team can play football. Um, yeah. Pitches, wind, rain, everything else, you know, they all have a factor. So, yeah, I think he's clever enough to know which division he's in, which type of play he needs, in which position. But I do still see. Yeah, that's the football style that he likes. And I certainly do still see Jim on the side of that pitch, that very bark on his orders. Um, <laughs> in the way only Jim Gannon does. Um, yes. let's, let's, think, let's think back to, then to your, your playing days at County. When, when initially you first heard Stockport County might be interested in you, um, just talk us through kind of where you were, your setup, and how you first heard of the interest? Like, what what did it make you feel? How did it come about? Just what happened? What was going on? Yeah, I was um, I was playing for Macclesfield Town, um, who sadly yesterday wound up. You know, that's so unfortunate. I think that deserves a mention. Yeah. Right? It's sad, oh, sad, sad, sad times. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, Barry a few months ago again in the former club of mine actually been around the northwest, but uh, yeah. I was playing for Macclesfield Town and we played Stockport in a, a Christmas time friendly. Uh, I had a reasonable game, but I think County won. Um, 
I think I was up against Jason Taylor. He was playing right wing that day. And I gave him a bit of a tough time. Obviously, obviously not met him a few times. Two lollipops. <laughs> Uh, he won't like me saying that, but yeah, I think I got him booked that day for just flying past him a bit too easily. Uh, but, <laughs> me. Uh, but yeah, another good mate of mine, by the way, J Bo, still playing, still doing well. Um, and after that game, Jim was shaking hands of various players, and he, he just, he just, you know, he said to me on the pitch, Well played, so I said, Dude, well done. Um, I can't remember his exact, exact words, but he said something to insinuate that he. He wouldn't mind working with me, uh, which was the first time that had happened to me. I was actually out of contact at Macclesfield in, in the next two weeks. But back then, I was only on a six month contract. Um, and yeah, two weeks later, I was sat with Wardy in uh, a hotel in Altringham with my dad. Um, and Yes, yeah, sign of a country. I was so, so excited. Just the size of the club. Uh, I was daunted by it, to be honest. I was very daunted by it. Uh, but, yeah, I was totally in there and, and staying with the boys. It was amazing. What were your first impressions when you when you looked around the squad of players that were there? You know, and the, the, you can tell that this is a club in the ascendancy. You know, they, they're just they're breaking records. They're going up the tables. Yeah. yeah. What, what were you? What were your impressions? I was, um, I, I weren't studying support by any means, uh, but I was aware of them because I had just played against them a couple of weeks earlier and I knew, and, you know, I knew key players, I didn't know every player, uh, but instantly I just got the feeling of, of, of when I left Mac and went to Stockport, that wow, this is a serious club, it's a really good club, um, Training ground, stadium. It was all there. The infrastructure was there, and the professionalism was another level. Um, yeah. It was good players straight away from the first, you know, a few training sessions before. There's some really, really talented boys here. Um, but again, I just didn't realise how good they actually were and how how good a career, you know, so many of them would go on to have. Uh, Ash William, Tommy Rowe, Anthony Wilkinson, Gary Bicker. You know, it's tons of them, tons of them. Um, yeah, it was. It just felt like I'd really stepped into football when I arrived at County. I'd really stepped into a serious club. Going to give that guy a sec. When you um, when you came to leave, I'll give him a minute. Sounds like you've got Aerosmith living next door. <laughs> um, when um, when when you came to leave. County when 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 that kind of happened, Brighton obviously a big club on the way up. Um, just again, similar kind of mindset. What happened there? What were your? How did you hear about it? What happened? Um, and how did you feel about moving on? You know, I, I didn't want to leave County. We were we'd been promoted. I got a new contract, uh, and as I say, I was there January to January. So I went January in League Two. And Stockport had just got out of the bottom half of the table when I arrived. We made it 12th, uh, bottom of the top half. And we went on an incredible run. It felt like we won all the time. And that year, historically, we won at Wembley, which was amazing. I then got a new contract um, that summer because there was a bit of interest in me from other clubs. Um, and no hesitation in signing because I couldn't have been more happier. I felt like I found the perfect combination manager and I felt so fortunate to play with that group of players. I thought they were so good yeah. and they all complemented me so well. Um but then move on we started off well I think the first game was put the other way. And again that felt like we stepped up another level. League one felt yeah this is this is gonna suit us with even more football, nicer pitches, bigger stadium. Um and we were halfway through that year. Obviously, it was getting towards Christmas time. We were doing well. We were up there. Um, we were the playoff area. Um, I heard you know, the club were in all sorts of financial trouble. Um, there was interest in a few of us. Myself, Tommy, uh, Pilks, um, Dicko and Ash had already left in the summer gone. Uh, but... It was a bit of a fire sale in terms of anything that was a saleable asset, so I had to go. And I remember I really didn't want to want to go, but 
Um, there's a few big clubs, you know, sniffing after me. Um, and I was quite down down the line in the end with a uh, heading to Leeds, Leeds United, but um, Brighton outbid Leeds and Stockport told me that you know you're going to the highest bidder. The money we need the money. It's key at the moment. We were sharing the ground with the rugby club at the time, and there was a bit of a financial black hole, unfortunately, which is a shame because I wish that team could have stayed together. But we simply couldn't afford to hold on to our assets. I ended up not going to move back to Brighton twice in that January. And then in the end, I had a phone call with Jim. It must have been January 30th or 31st. And I think, you know, 12 hours later, I was down there signing with Brighton. Uh, and I, I was just unsure about it all because. We were flying high in League One, Brighton were in the, the relegation zone. Financially, it was, you know, it was a much greater topic to go down to Brighton. And I was excited by playing for another big club, but you know, it, it felt it felt a sorry time to leave football. It was it was a big factor. Yeah. It's um again, it's another common theme that's coming up, you know, players talking about that kind of time in such a romantic way that it came to an end probably a little bit too soon. I, I wanted to ask you. And apologies if this is putting you on the spot a little bit. When 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 you, when you were coming to the end of your time at County, when you moved on, we heard stories that you had injury problems with a lung condition. Was that was that what what was what was going on there? Was that was that real? Was that happening? No, no, there's nothing in that. I'm not too sure, not too sure what what that was. I mean, when I left Stockport, I went down to to Brighton, um, got on my debut, and then unfortunately a couple of days later. Uh, so not a couple of days later, a couple of games later, I rubbed with a kidney in, in a match. Kidney, and sorry, I, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was that was just purely a 50-50 challenge or a nasty challenge in the end. It was missed time. Um, yeah, I ruptured my kidney playing for Brighton, which sort of hindered me before I'd even started. I was I was just just getting off the ground there, and then, yeah, I ruptured my kidney. That that was. A, that middle stage in my career ended up being, you know, such a long period of consecutive injuries. It was at a point where I really didn't know if I was going to stay fit and, and be able to carry on playing. I, I lost a lot of time through that centre throughout my career. 24, 27, 28. Um, but definitely and how and how was that bouncing back from it? Because you, you've obviously got into a position now where you're a really, really well-respected League One player. You know, you, you're a player who's had a really good career. But, you know, we, it's difficult. Like you say, when you go through those injuries, we hear so many players that are on the up, something happens, and it's, it's game over. But you've come back from that. How how, how, was, how was that journey? Um, yeah, action-packed. Plenty of other chapters, obviously, highs and lows, which football is yeah. for. If you are going to last, you know, any length of time in football, you know, sort of go into your thirties and, and still be in the game competitive and stuff like that, things have got to be done right. And most of that comes from mentality. You, you've kind of got to learn early that there's going to be so many lows and there's going to be so many nearlies for you that you have to get over. Um, you know, I nearly went to some of the clubs that I really wanted to, but I never because. Situation to figure out on my control. And it's right, and you know, when I did finally get fit down there, again, it was, it was nearly moved that, you know, it was so exciting for me, but we went to be for different reasons again out of my control. There's so much in terms of body blows to your mentality in football. And unless you've got a certain, you know, capacity to cope with those knocks all the time, um, you, you won't be able to keep moving forward. But, yeah, um, stuff will help me learn that. Um, right, and did with all the injuries, and, and you know, just went on to play several other clubs with, with a similar story. Just just to start wrapping up, Jim, right? nothing wrong with being in your early 30s and still trying to have a career in football. My five aside one is still blossoming, but um, just, just talk to us a little bit about your plans to stay in the game. You, how, how many years do you see yourself playing, and then, and then what comes next? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm 35 now. I'll be 36 when this contract finishes with Rochdale, uh, where I've been for the last five years. Um, you know, I'm really enjoying my football here. Rochdale's been similar to Stockport in terms of 
it just found something that fits with managers that have, you know, have fitted me personally. Um, I, I've agreed with the way they play football. And it suited me as a player. So I found something that I've enjoyed. Um, it's a little bit different to Stockport and Rochdale because we're punching above our weight a little bit more in League One. Rochdale, we don't quite get as many supporters through the door as County did. Um, and it, it's always always an uphill battle and playing against huge teams in League One. But you know, we we managed to, to keep keep surviving year after year, which has been good. Um, we're just trying we're trying for something a bit more special than that if we can. Um, and after football, Chris, I really don't know, mate. Um, I've been doing bits and bobs while I've been playing. Obviously, the coaching badges, like so many other lads have done, I kind of tip them off just in case an opportunity ever arises. I'd love to stay in the game. Um, done some bits and bobs in journalism, ended up going to university to do a degree on that, which was interesting. Um, but truthfully, I don't think many of us are exiting the game saying, I'm definitely going to be X, Y, or Z because it's, it's just so uncertain and so much of it is. Yeah. Um, based on opportunity and based on time and what's available at that particular time. So I'd love to stay in the game. Um, I think deep down my calling would be to manage. I'd love to manage a football club. I'd love to have a crack at that. But I suppose that to earn my trade in that first. Um, was, you know, like the fact you're an old footballer, the second you finish, if you want to be a coach, you're probably a young coach. So you're starting again. You go from being the old yeah. guy to the young guy. Well, we might see if there's a position here as a co-host. Get you involved on the on the county live podcast. Yeah. Just finally, Jim, speaking speak about players who go on into the the later thirties, if you like, you've been playing with another former county stalwart who just seems to be absolutely endless. Aaron Wilbram was at Rochdale with you for a while. Just what an absolute machine! The man himself, larger than life character. Um, I, I still speak to Albie a lot. I still see him a lot actually because we live close. Um, he is a machine, and, and truthfully, he's an incredible pro. Behind the scenes, Albie does so much. Uh, we were travelling buddies into Rochdale while he was here, and we were also hotel roomies. So, uh, yeah, I got to see him first. And Albie, larger-than-life character, rock-solid belief, which, again, rock-solid mentality, like I mentioned earlier, and an incredible professional. To play to 40 is, is, is something... Aaron's currently a free agent, but won't surprise me one bit if we see Aaron suddenly sign with someone, suddenly scoring some special goals on Sky Sports News with a camera in his face saying, how the hell are you still doing this at 41? With, with, listen, with his CV, there will be a bunch of clubs who'd, uh, who'd roll the dice, for sure. Um, listen, Jim, it's, it's, been a, it's been a treasure having you on today, and it, it was good seeing you again at County the other week. You're going to... Yeah, if, if yeah. possible, with all the, I imagine, fixtures moving around with this nonsense going on. Are you uh, going to try and get to a game or two this season, if if, if everything allows? Well, I have done over the years. Um, I've always tried to, to nip down to the odd game. Obviously, like I mentioned, I'm not too far away. Um, so, yeah, myself and my dad, we still nip to the odd county game um, just to watch football, really, and to watch someone that you've been associated with. But I'm excited for this season for... For County, the team looks exciting. The new additions look stand out, really, for the division. The new training ground, Carrington, and you know, Reigns is really excited about the things he sees going on there behind the scenes and stuff. So, good times, mate. And it's, it's good for the fans. I really hope the fans get to, you know, go on a journey again back into the league. And if, if, if that sleeping giant gets going again, which, which it is, it's on the move again, it, it, it could be something special. Yeah, Jim, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Not a problem, Chris. Pleasure is all mine, mate. Thank you. Top man. Just okay. before I let you go, Jim, thanks very much for that. Um, your yeah. internet did crackle a bit, but I think I can work with it in the edit. Just very quickly before we let we go, before I let you go, we're doing um, I might have told you this the other day. We're doing like a video montage the day before the season of a load of former players just wishing the lads luck for the season. Yeah. Would you mind just giving like a 10 second just good luck message to Jim and the boys? Not a problem. Not a problem. Tom, on. Give me one sec. I'm going to make you full screen. And just in your own time, mate. To Jim and all the players, wishing you all a great season, boys. Got a great squad together there. And yeah, I really fancy us. So fingers crossed uh, that we're back in the league next season. Good luck. 
Fuck that, mate. Like a pro. I tell absolutely everyone this. Tommy Rowe had four goals at that. Couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Uh, wonder one say listen thank you very much for that mate I'll let you bounce on but um, I'll let you know when it goes out tag you in it on social and all the rest of it and hopefully see you again soon yeah mate I hope you don't have to uh, repeat that based on the background noise the banging was heavy at one point there wasn't it it was it was and I think that was probably playing with your internet a little bit as well but we can there's, fil- there's filters that the producers have in house where they can like minimise background noise yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm hoping it can pick out, pick out things on that but um, the way the way that the radio station work it is they put the full length video on YouTube, and then they take clips out for like little clips on Facebook and on the radio. Yeah. So they'll they'll find loads of things that, 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 that do the numbers. All right, mate. Yeah, that sounds that sounds. <laughs> By the way, I did that interview with the Sowerlands last night and Dillian White's brother. And um, <laughs> yeah, good. He's an absolute. He's an absolute matter. The guy. He's is just. He, yeah. yeah, he's like. Um, he carries these little day enhancers in a packet of Skittles if he's like work, like working around the clock and stuff. And he's like, I just need a bit of a kick just because I've been working since three o'clock yesterday afternoon. So he's like, okay. all right. <laughs> like, Whatever you say. <laughs> like you're not, I'm not going to ask any questions, mate. Yeah. <laughs> just, um, I can imagine. But, it's, uh, crazy. it's crazy. Like, he, But he's talking about, you know, getting two of his fighters in with... Andy Joshua and um, oh, who was it? No, Andy Joshua and, and uh, Sean Porter later in the year and stuff. And it was like, fair enough, man. Like, fair enough. Good for the show, mate. Anyway, you get, you're having like serious, serious boys on that show, aren't you? Oh, mate, it's doing really well. We've got um, who've we got next? We've got Sean Porter. We've got Andy Crawler. But then, just this morning, the WBC. The PR, the, the woman who runs a PR for the WBC, I've worked with her before. She dropped me a message saying, "Would you like um, the president of the WBC to come on your show?" Now that's like, is Richard Scudamore still the, the, the big boy at the Premier League? The Premier League, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like he's like boxing's version of that, and he's wow. asked us if we can come on the show. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> of course. <Okay. laughs> so um, it's decent that. Where's he based, mate? Yeah. He's based in Las Vegas. Fucking hell. So what, you'll do it similar to this? Just like this. Yeah, so what we do is literally just um, just do that. Ah, oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mate, that's good, that. Good, good stuff. It's moving on. Yeah, always, mate, always. And like I say, if, if we can help you out in any way with the journal stuff, football yeah. or boxing, let yeah. us know whatever we can do top man top man much appreciate yeah. you right mate you have a good day I'm going to go get a sandwich and I'll, um, I'll catch you in a little bit alright lad cheers for that mate see you in a bit see you later mate